Existential Ethics, Thinking Hard About Lawyer Responsibility for Clients' Environmental Harm Stephen Vaughan Current Legal Problems, Volume 76, Issue 1, 2023, published, the 2nd of June, 2023. Abstract This paper challenges the conventional understanding among many legal ethicists that environmental harm can be a necessary, if regrettable, collateral effect of lawyerly work. It argues that lawyers sometimes do things that cost society too much and that legal ethics, being the rules of ethical conduct set out by regulators of lawyers and broader theories of good lawyering, has the potential to act as a mediator on lawyers' environmental harm causing action. The paper begins by examining lawyers' formal rules of professional conduct in England and Wales, showing how those rules require lawyers to provide active counselling to clients, but do not fully address clients' legally permissible choices, that may result in environmental harm. The paper then turns to theories of legal ethics that go beyond these baseline rules. Here, I argue that the dominant standard conception of lawyers as neutral technicians is not only implausible in the context of environmental law, but also fundamentally incomplete. The paper also considers the ethical implications of a lawyer's initial decision to represent a client. The commonly held belief that everyone deserves legal advice often masks a simple ethical choice, where lawyers prioritize commercial concerns over environmental considerations, unburdened by more complex ethical constraints. However, this rationalization rests on unsound premises and frequently clashes with lawyers' personal moral boundaries, a problem I label meatloaf lawyering. Ultimately, I argue that lawyers have significant ethical agency and that their professional obligations do not impede, and sometimes require, an active, ethically responsible stance towards environmental harms. 1. Introduction Let me begin with a story, partly because it is a good story and partly because narrative is an important part of environmental law scholarship. 1. After I finished my law degree, I came to London and started my training as a lawyer. On a blind date, I was met by a handsome guy in a bar in Soho. We got to talking about our jobs. I'm a lawyer, I said. What sort of lawyer? He asked. An environmental lawyer? I replied. He smiled. Oh wow, he said you get to save the whales. There was then a long and awkward pause. Actually, I said, I'm probably on what you would think of as the whale-killing side of the legal profession. I act for fossil fuel companies and arms manufacturers. The date ended quickly after that. What I found interesting, as I cried alone into my martini, was the assumption my blind date had made that being an environmental lawyer went together with protecting the environment when, in my experience, that was not necessarily the case. Only later in my career, when I left one large law firm for another, did I stop to really think about the consequences of the work that I was being asked to do for my clients. Until that time, I had largely accepted the justification fed to me by the partners that I worked for that everyone deserves legal advice. Such lack of reflection and such rationalization are endemic in many parts of the legal profession. To this paper is concerned with lawyer responsibility and shows how some of the perfectly legal environmental harms that lawyers help their clients create raise important and significant questions about the ethics of that lawyering. It is, quite intentionally, a paper of multiple arguments and multiple angles, spanning lawyer regulation, theoretical legal ethics and the practices of law firms onboarding new clients and new matters. These multiple takes coalesce around an overarching broad claim that lawyers sometimes do things that cost society, in the form of environmental harms, too much. What I show is that lawyers have significant ethical agency, and that their professional obligations do not impede, and often require, an active, ethically responsible stance towards environmental harms. These matters are worth considering in some depth for three reasons. First, because of the seriousness of the environmental harms we are facing. Second, because of the roles that lawyers play in actively facilitating those harms through the advice they give. And third, because key to the legitimacy of lawyers' claims to professional status is, as Richard Mulhead has said, a manifest and demonstrable commitment both in principle and in practice to exercise knowledge and skills primarily in the public interest. Placing the public interest above both the lawyer's self, interest and that of their clients, three these matters are also timely. There is recent and increasing environmental activism aimed directly at large law firms, Four recurrent claims of greenwashing labelled against firms and their clients. Five and ongoing conversations among regulators and representative groups about lawyers as professional enablers of problematic harms. Six in what follows. 
I do three different but connected things. I begin by arguing that professional rules of conduct place some limits on the work lawyers do that led to environmental harm sought by their clients, showing how those professional rules require a reflection by lawyers about their responsibility for consequential environmental harms and require engagement in active client counseling. Those conduct rules mean that lawyers should not loophole, bully or cheat to achieve their clients' environmental harm-causing aims. 7. At the same time, those professional conduct rules are less useful where a client says I have listened to your advice and would still like to proceed with these perfectly legal, environmental harm-causing activities in those situations. And as a second strand of this paper, I counsel us to think about the relevance of the competing theories of lawyers' ethics. I focus on the standard conception. 8. The dominant approach to lawyers' ethics. I do this to show how the standard conception is ultimately an impoverished account of legal ethics, and one entirely unsuited to the environmental harms we face. Third, this paper draws back the veil on client and matter onboarding. It argues that the decision for a solicitor or law firm to take on a new matter for a new client is not one of legal ethics, but instead one of ordinary morality, that is morality away from any specific ethical obligations of certain role. Hold a professional's point nine. The position is much the same when deciding whether or not to act for an existing client on a new matter, subject only to the complication of the law firm, possibly being on the client's panel of external legal advisors, and having won that place after a competitive pitching process. 10. While the ethics of acting for a client who wishes to use the law to harm the environment is, as we shall see, complex, agreeing to take on the new client, and or new matter in the first place, should be rather simple for lawyers in ethical terms. What I show is that arguments that practicing lawyers like to put forward about access to justice, that everyone deserves legal advice account, do not stand up to much scrutiny, especially in the context of legal work for large corporations that want to harm the environment. At the same time, many lawyers have their own, deeply personal red lines about work they would refuse to do. 11 here, what I call meatloaf lawyering, the work limiting boundary expressed by a number of lawyers that I would do anything for my clients, but I won't do that, offers a challenge to the suggestion that solicitors and firms only take on clients who want to seriously harm the environment. On consistent, public interest-related basis, two points to note before we turn to substance. First, while my focus in this paper is on lawyers' ethics, the professional codes in England and Wales and dedicated theories, there are of course other drivers of action, that might see lawyers take decisions that led to less environmentally harmful outcomes. These drivers and factors include law firm reputation 12, pressure from law firm employees or new hires 13, pressure from clients who are increasingly interested in environmental, social, and governance, ESG, matters 14, the competing logics that are at play 15, and the normative clash of lawyer obligations in tort, contract and equity as well as professional obligations. Point 0.16. There are also the business benefits for law firms of acting in certain ways when it comes to environmental harm 17, and the many ways in which environmental governance, hard and soft, local and elsewhere, an increased regulatory and investor interest is nudging and pushing many actors, including lawyers, towards more and better environmental protection. 18. These are relevant and not unimportant drivers of and frames for action but largely irrelevant to lawyers' obligations under their professional codes and to the standard conception. Second, in what follows, I will not speak to the good things that law firms do for the environment, such as trying to reduce their emissions from their law firm buildings, 19 or membership of the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, or advising on, financing and facilitating the buying and selling of renewable energy, in getting into the heart of the blurred boundary between the technical and moral aspects of, lawyers, work, 20. I disagree with Brad Wendell that the ambitions of legal ethics should be toned down a bit, and that the role of the legal profession is not to make clients or the surrounding society good. In an ethical sense, point to one instead, I would argue that as professionals who are meant to deploy their expertise in the public interest, to respond in this context to existential environmental harms, members of the legal profession may, and sometimes should, do exactly that. I accept, of course, that some environmental harms are hard to establish and that some harms clearly involve complex trade-offs. 22. My goal here is not to engage in lawyer shaming, to saddle lawyers with moral blame, 
if they provided legal assistance to a client bent on pursuing antisocial projects, and did so without violating any applicable standards of professional conduct. Point two three, it is instead to show how the actions of lawyers, as lawyers, in harming the environment may in fact be crossing, or at least rubbing up against, their professional codes of conduct in amount to an ethical conduct too. The environmental harms, we face and lawyers' roles in those harms, as a species and as a planet, we are facing significant environmental harms, many of which are almost certain to only get worse over time, climate change, air pollution, biodiversity loss, deforestation, chemical harms, waste pollution, poor water quality and so on. Somewhere in the story of each of these harms, and in many other stories, are lawyers. 24 in those stories, lawyers take on various roles and do various things in relation to the environment. 25 they work in law firms large and small, they work for the government and regulators as civil servants, they work in-house in large corporations and charities, these lawyers make things happen for their clients at national and international scales. 26, the sale and financing of fossil fuel fired plants, the shipping of waste overseas etc. 27 lawyers also seek, in both the private and public sectors, to shape and negotiate future environmental laws on their clients' behalves. 28 lawyers engage in the drafting of environmental laws, and also advance and agree legal meanings in relation to environmental law in contracts and other non-legislative fora. 29 lawyers advise on how changing regulatory environments may impact on, and provide opportunities for, clients' businesses and interests. 30 lawyers take part in the adjudication and arbitration of environmental law disputes. 31 lawyers are, put short, very active when it comes to environmental issues and harms. In this paper, I am interested in matters in which environmental lawyers are involved and which have some legal basis, but which are environmentally problematic, lawful but awful. To borrow a phrase, 32 as should be clear from the preceding discussions, I am concerned both with environmental lawyers, those who profess expertise in environmental law and self-label as having such expertise, and with other lawyers whose work leads to environmental harms, the finance lawyer who helps to put in place loans for the building of a new coal-fired power plant, and similar. Point three three. In these lawful but awful situations, the conduct of the lawyer as a lawyer may be more or less problematic. I divide these cases into the prima facie or obviously ethically problematic cases, such as where lawyers bully, cheat or loophole or take unfair advantage of their opponents, and then the more difficult and not so obviously ethically problematic cases, 34 We have seen lawyers bring libel claims and fraud counterclaims against environmental defenders. 35 And racketeering claims against environmental NGOs. 36 Lawyers threaten to remove statutory protections given to environmental groups when court decisions went against the government. 37 They loophole lawyered on the international climate regime's clean development mechanism to create, in effect, artificial reduced emissions credits. 38 Lawyers instituted appear review process of environmental evidence that led to experts changing their evidence 39, and they deployed legal intimidation tactics by a mining company, which were said to be a threat to democracy. 40 government lawyers sought to bankrupt, via punitive costs orders, a conservation organization for bringing claims against the government. 41 other lawyers applied for overly wide injunctions against environmental protesters. 42 and engaged in disproportionate approaches to jurisdiction cases on environmental harms including the dress, iron, up of disputes in a particular way, ignoring well, known warnings given to them by judges about litigation conduct. 43. We have seen lawyers engage in repeated litigation delays and other tactics on toxic wastewater claims. 44 and in relation to raw sewage flooding, 45 lawyers were said to have deployed bullying techniques directed at university environmental law clinics, including legislation to withhold university funding. 46 and in facilitating the reckless, bordering on deliberate shipping of waste to India and Indonesia, after their client was successfully prosecuted for the same issue previously. 47 in each of the examples just listed, from the UK and beyond, we have lawyers loopholing, cheating, bullying taking unfair advantage and so on, to enable clients' environmentally harmful conduct. In this set of examples both the means to the end, and the ends themselves are of concern. These are situations which might, at first blush, look ethically problematic in some way, 
but where no action was taken by regulators or courts to suggest that those actions crossed a professional conduct line, lawful, but awful, by contrast, in another set of more difficult, and not so obviously ethically problematic, cases, lawyers are part of the narrative of environmental harms, they are in the room where it happened, but their lawyering was, as a starting point, well within the conventionally understood bounds of existing professional conduct rules, these are the sort of perfectly legal environmental harm causing cases, a client says, help me with this new oil and gas licensing round and the lawyer does the lawyering which achieves just that. These are situations in which we are not concerned with lawyer tactics, but with the choice of client or matter and the environmental harms the client wishes to pursue. In these latter situations, by contrast to the first set of cases, we are more concerned with the ends than the means. Lawful, and also awful. 3. The regulation of lawyers' ethics. How might we assess the ethicality of the work of lawyers, who help their clients to cause environmental harms, when people, scholars, practitioners, and others, talk about ethics and lawyers they are often unclear on their framings or meanings. 48 First, we can talk about professional conduct, and the rules written by the regulators of lawyers that seek to shape how lawyers act, legal ethics put on paper.49 Second, we can also talk about theories of ethics that have been created for lawyers in particular, and where these theories seek to provide role morality schemas for justifying or not justifying the actions that lawyers take. 53rd, we have what is usually referred to by legal and other philosophers as ordinary morality, the ethics of everyday people, which, as I suggest below, is relevant for when lawyers are thinking about taking on new clients, or new mandates with environmentally harmful consequences. When it comes to legal ethics written down in England and Wales for solicitors, the Solicitors Regulation Authority, SRA, takes a three-pronged approach to standard setting. 1. It sets out higher-level principles. Two. It gives a series of detailed, topic-specific rules on conduct, and 3. It promulgates a statement on the competence of qualified solicitors, which includes, among other things, ethical competence. Point five one. The regulator also produces guidance on key issues. Below, I focus on the principles. Their starting point is in the Legal Services Act 2007 and they are then given life in the SRA STARS, its standards and regulations which are in turn based on previous professional codes of conduct. 52 The SRA says that its principles comprise the fundamental tenets of ethical behavior that we expect all those that we regulate to uphold. Point five three, or, as the chair of the SRA board put it in 2007, the principles set out what should be at the heart of what it means to be a solicitor. Point five four, one of the many things that is striking about the principles is that they apply to everything a solicitor does. They are pervasive and mandatory. 55 They are also not ranked. The current principles say that solicitors should act 56, in a way that upholds the constitutional principle of the rule of law, and the proper administration of justice in a way that upholds public trust and confidence in the solicitor's profession, and in legal services provided by authorized persons with independence with honesty with integrity in a way that encourages equality, diversity and inclusion in the best interests of each client. The regulatory scheme of professional ethics that the SRA promulgates via its principles is unusual in that it explicitly accepts a particular form of justice, one that is uncommon among other common law legal services regulators. What the SRA does is to make compulsory a form of socially responsible lawyering, even if we might debate how strong or a weak a form of social responsibility the SRA in fact promotes. At no point, nowhere in these principles, or elsewhere in its regulatory toolkit, does that SRA say that the client or the client's interests come first? This often comes as something of a surprise to practicing solicitors. 57 Instead, the regulator says that a complex matrix of things, the rule of law, independence, integrity and so on, operate in tandem, together with acting in the best interests of each client. What the regulator also does is to set out what should happen when its principles rub up against each other. 58 Should the principles come into conflict? those which safeguard the wider public interest, such as the rule of law, and public confidence in a trustworthy solicitor's profession, and a safe and effective market for regulated legal services, take precedence over an individual client's interests. 59 In what follows I want to think about what the SRA's principles mean, both generally and in the context of environmental harms. I begin with independence and integrity. A. Independence as a professional principle. 
Independent sees lawyers as mediators between their clients and the state, 60 in one direction. Independence means lawyers protecting clients from unwarranted interference by the state. This reflects a certain liberal, market conception of the rule of law. In the other direction, independence means that lawyers should be setting limits on how their clients use the law. As Emma Oakley and I have argued elsewhere, professional independence is thought to ensure that professionals exercise their professional judgment in individual cases in line with communal standards of competence and ethicality, and in a detached fashion. 61 at least in theory, independent professionals and their specialist knowledge can simultaneously serve the wider public interest, as well as the interests of their clients. Limited guidance from the Legal Services Board sets out that professional independence means solicitors shying away from unwarranted influence. S.62 The courts, in their handful of cases on this principle, say independence requires solicitors saying, no to clients and accepting that independence might lead to negative financial impacts for the solicitor. 63 Put another way, independence is about professional distance, about not becoming so close to a client that you forget about your professional status and obligations. It is about not being a poodle, despite what this very senior lawyer in a city firm once told me 64, because, most law firms, we're hired hands and we're instructed to do things, and if your client says, I want you to go in there and be a poodle, you go and be a poodle, and if they say I want you to go there and rip these guys to pieces, that's what you try and do, the professional principle of independence is a reminder, and an obligation, that solicitors should be wise counselors and not hired guns, 65 be integrity integrity is a difficult principle to get one's hands around, there being at least six different philosophical accounts of integrity as a virtue, 66 and little guidance for solicitors on integrity meaning making. Robert Audi and Patrick Murphy argue that in a great many cases, integrity is a specific sounding term for something like moral soundness, whose exact character is left in specified. 67 case law on solicitors tells us that integrity is thought to denote a higher moral standard than honesty, requiring a moral soundness, rectitude and steady adherence to an ethical code. 68 Jackson LJ framed the principle as follows in Wingate and Evans. In professional codes of conduct the term integrity is a useful shorthand to express the higher standards which society expects from professional persons, and which the professions expect from their own members. 69 Integrity as higher standards, does not take us very far, however, the SRA sets out that it will take action in relation to a lack of integrity where a solicitor takes unfair advantage of others, and or where they have knowingly or recklessly caused harm or distress to another and or where clients or third parties have been misled or allowed to be misled. 70 as such, integrity, like independence, tempers acting like an automaton on a client's instructions. 71 these principles mean, and the regulator clearly accepts that they mean. 72 that there are limits to what lawyers can and should do when it comes to advising on potential environmental harms, and that tactical lawyering may often be outside those limits. There is nothing new about me suggesting that these SRA principles have a tempering function. 73. Save that that sort of tempering and those sorts of limits are not especially helpful when the environmental harms that clients want to bring about are clearly legal, and where the lawyer is acting well within the ambit of the principles. A client says help me with this new oil and gas licensing round and the lawyer does just that, with no loopholing or bullying etc. The SRA's other principles, however, likely have greater purchase. C. The rule of law Alan Hutchinson reminds us that, there is a relatively clear and shared norm that underwrites the work and privileged position of lawyers in most societies. It is a commitment to the rule of law. 0.74 However, what actually constitutes a professional commitment to the rule of law opens space for more competing views. 75 As set out above, the SRA principles require solicitors to act in a way that upholds the constitutional principle of the rule of law. The regulator, however, does not give guidance on what this principle means, including whether the word constitutional is somehow intended to shape the framing or content of the rule of law. 76. What is also a challenge is that lawyers are often periphery players, if mentioned at all, in many academic accounts of the rule of law, meaning that their roles and functions are under-theorized and largely absent. 77. This is surprising. Bob Gordon reminds us that lawyers are part of constructing the complex of norms, institutions, specialized staffs, and cultural dispositions that make up the incredibly plural and contested 
set of social practices that are grouped under the broad umbrella label of the rule of law. Point seven eight. Here, lawyers can either be instruments of enhancing autocratic rule and extending the state's authority by lending it legitimacy and helping it secure the co. Operation it needs or lawyers can serve as centers of resistance to novel impositions of authority. Point seven nine. Martin Crigier writes that the rule of law is not a thing like a stone we might stumble over, but a complex practical ideal. Point eight zero. Just as the idea, content and practices of the rule of law are complex and contested in general, taking the form, as Jeremy Waldron so vividly puts it, of different laundry lists of demands, 81 they remain contested, and do not become any easier, when it comes to thinking about how lawyers, as product, servants and agents of the rule of law, should act in relation to the climate crisis and other environmental harms, 82 given this, what the rule of law via the SRA's principles asks or may require of solicitors will likely look different depending on whether one individual lawyer, firm, regulator and or representative group, adopts a thicker or thinner conception of the rule of law thinner conceptions that focus on questions of legal procedure, structure, and the formulation of laws, and, those, thicker conceptions, which include social and political rights at their core. Point eight three in particular, questions arise about how much the focus should be for lawyers on the thinner, formal and or procedural aspects of the rule of law, and how much they should be reflecting on, and then seeking to deliver, the thicker, values which might underpin the rule of law, 84. Let me give an example. In 2021, I was at an event in the City of London, a debate on whether law firms can have a purpose beyond profit. In the Q&A section of the event, a senior partner at a law firm expressed the view that all law firms have a ready-made societal purpose, meaning there was no need to adopt one, as providing their clients with legal advice was a key part of the rule of law. It seemed to me that that senior partner had a formal and or procedural conception of the rule of law which he thought went hand in hand with political neutrality 85, he saw the rule of law as a threshold condition for a valid legal system, while nevertheless remaining neutral on the substantive ends that may be pursued by law. 86, my sense was that that partner was arguing, implicitly, that a thinner, formal and or procedural, understanding of the rule of law sees lawyers do all that they can to advise on and enact the law as drafted, to give effect to rule of law ideas of legal certainty and legality, 87 However, this thin framing is one thing when the law is settled and the client's legal entitlements clear, but another when there is scope for interpretation, and the exercise of discretion by a lawyer, or where the law is frequently changing. 88 The same is true in the situation where we do not have law on a particular topic, and instead perhaps have soft, norms or international laws not translated into local commitments. These challenges are especially relevant for environmental law and environmental harms. Kerry Warnock has said that legal certainty, one core aspect of thinner, procedural takes on the rule of law, is harder when it comes to environmental law problems. 89 This is because, as Jonas Ibesen has written, identifying what the law requires in environmental law involves a complex weighing exercise of statute, which is often open texture, precedent, principles, guidelines, international agreements and so on. Equally, and as Liz Fisher, Eloise Scottford and Emily Barrett have framed it, climate change is highly polycentric, uncertain, and dynamic nature presents particular challenges for legal orders and adjudication. Point nine zero being hot law. 91 Environmental law is less amenable to false legal certainties and requires an acceptance of complexity and the exercise of discretion by lawyers, judges and others, as Jeff Twentyman, a Magic Circle law firm partner, has observed, the rule of law can, cast a long shadow under which commercial solicitors occasionally and conveniently shelter from daylight. Point nine two too often lawyers use terms, like the rule of law, as, magic solving words that in reality beg the question. Point nine three. this displays a preference by those lawyers for, meaningless, formalism and an ignorance of context, a less generous commentator might say that a thinner, more formal and or procedural conception of the rule of law usefully allowed, as a form of post hoc rationalization, that particular law firm in my previous example, to continue to act in the long shadow of the rule of law, without much reflection or angst, for their important and lucrative oil and gas clients, the argument being that such oil and gas work is perfectly legal. Here, 
Paul Craig reminds us that formal conceptions of the rule of law do not address the actual content of the law itself. Point nine four. What should lawyers do where they feel that there is a lack of fit between legal and moral rights? When legal rights appear unjust or otherwise morally objectionable? 95 The challenge here, as Alan Hutchinson has argued, is that by depicting the rule of law as being only about procedural justice and not substantive justice, lawyers compound the very problem that legal ethics is supposed to resolve. It casts ethical behavior as little more than conformity to law without any real attention paid to the worthiness of any particular law or process. Point 96D The best interests of each client. The SRA principles also require solicitors to act in the best interests of each client. Little is said by the SRA about what this means, nor is there as much in the relevant case law to help frame this obligation. Despite this lack of guidance, it seems relatively clear that, in thinking about a client's best interests, a lawyer asked to help bring about environmental harms for the client will need and want to think about the long term as well as the short term. 97 About the scope of director's duties in an age of corporate social responsibility, and environmental social and governance regulation, and related norms. 98 And about a client's social license to operate. 99 As such, it is not unreasonable to argue that the obligation to act in a client's best interests, given what we know of increasing regulatory, financial and reputational risks to clients for environmental harms, even the legal ones means that lawyers should be thinking beyond getting the deal done and should be engaged in active client counseling on environmental impacts. 100 We might see this as an expanded form of climate conscious legal practice, as Kim Bauer and Brian Preston put it 101, where such environmental consciousness is a simply consequence of the principle requiring action in a client's best interests, and across the medium and longer terms, either public interest should the principles come into conflict, those which safeguard the wider public interest such as the rule of law, and public confidence in a trustworthy solicitor's profession, and a safe and effective market for regulated legal services, take precedence over an individual client's interests. 102 I noted earlier how the public interest can act as a tie, breaker in situations in which the SRA's principles come into conflict. There is something potentially very powerful here. We have recent UN recognition of a human right to a healthy environment, 103 following similar constitutional practices in many nation states 104, and we know what awful impacts environmental harms do and can have on society, and multiple forms of the public. We also recognize the environment as a relevant and important stakeholder in lots of different ways. Section 172 of the Companies Act 2006, giving standing to environmental NGOs 105, the granting of legal personality to parts of their environment, etc. 106 as such, when will it be in the public interest for lawyers to bring about environmental harms on behalf of their clients? There are two significant challenges, however, with this line of thinking. The first is that the public interest only gets engaged in regulatory terms when the principles come into conflict, and it is unclear when, how or how frequently that would happen with perfectly legal environmental harms where the solicitor was not doing any form of tactical lawyering, perhaps on occasion but infrequently, would be my guess. The second problem is what Maria Lee has called the uncertain and contested nature of public interests, and what we should or might do when environmental protection rubs up against things like the economy or defense or food or health provision. 107. If we add in temporal challenges, what the public interest means now or for a different future is 108, and geographical challenges, which publics, whose interests, 109, this makes scoping out the public interest when it comes to environmental harms particularly challenging. Let me recap about lawyers' ethics written down. While the principles are useful when it comes to tempering and seeking to prevent tactical lawyering, what I have labeled the easy ethically problematic cases of environmental harms, the most they likely require is counseling when it comes to the perfectly legal, properly lawyered environmental harm causing matters. If counseling is given by a solicitor, we don't think you should engage in this new oil and gas licensing round for the environmental harms that will be caused, but ignored, what then? For that question, we need to engage in lawyer's ethics for theories of lawyer's ethics. The SRA's principles we have just considered are not maximums. They are, instead, a baseline of the ethicality required by the law, the SRA's rules providing minimal standards of acceptable conduct, bounding off behavior which is clearly unacceptable, 
110 Given this, we can use and explore a theories of lawyer's ethics, both as what might be required or needed beyond the SRA baseline, and or to challenge deficiencies in the SRA's approach. 111 We might also want to say that, whatever the content of the rules, we have general views linked to notions of professionalism, and the special role of the lawyer in society, by which we can assess whether conduct is ethical or not. Christine Parker argues that while professional rules can be helpful in guiding behavior, they do not, or do not sufficiently, provide a basis for considering what values should motivate lawyer behavior and choices about what kind of lawyer to be. Point one one two, as the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal said in the case of Sims, 113, a solicitor, must and should on occasion be prepared to say to his client, what you seek to do may be illegal, but I am not prepared to help you do it. Point 114a, the standard conception, the competing approaches to lawyers' ethics are generally mutually exclusive attempts by academics to think about the position of lawyers in society and to create and substantiate frameworks that tell us how lawyers should act. 115 I focus in this paper on what is often called the standard conception. This approach to legal ethics argues that lawyers, should do all that is permissible for their clients within the bounds of the law and has lawyers acting as adversarial or zealous advocates. At the core of the standard conception is a mutually constituting value trinity, i. neutrality. It is not for the lawyer to be the judge of their client, 2. partisanship. The lawyer should do all that they can to advance their client's objectives, semicolon, and 3. what Wendell calls the magic shield or force field of non-accountability, the lawyer is not responsible for the client's decisions. Point 116 The standard conception is, as the name suggests, the dominant form of legal ethics, both among scholars and among practicing lawyers, including among environmental lawyers. Lawyers. Point 117 this is perhaps no surprise given the standard conception is so helpful to practitioners, by adopting a professional persona of hands-off neutrality, the profession manages to prioritize the values and interest of the status quo, and, to serve its own self, interest under the enabling cover of professional honor and expertise. Point 118. Some scholars who support the standard conception approach argue that we live in a pluralistic society based on competing notions of the public good that the institutions of law are designed to mediate between these diverse ranges of views, and that it is not for lawyers to determine what we will do as a community, what rights we will allocate, and to whom. Point 119 Others base their arguments instead on the lawyer as a technical mechanic, who should respect the autonomy of their client, 120 or on the idea of the civil obedience of a lawyer, who obeys the law even when it conflicts with her own morals, 121 A common thread in these academic accounts is that the moral justification and responsibility for action by a lawyer on a client's behalf lies at the institutional level, rather than the individual or a personal level. 122 Putting this into the context of environmental harms, a broad standard conception argument would go like this, regardless of how I personally feel about my client's plan to harm the environment, we live in a world with complex and competing views on natural resources, health, poverty, the economy and so on and laws have been democratically made which set out what my client can and cannot do, it's not my job to judge my client for seeking to do things that are legal, clients get to decide what they want to do, and they need me, as a lawyer, to help them do what they want to do, even if the environmental harms that arise are really significant, I find the standard conception a bitter pill to swallow, Reed Mortensen argues, and I would agree, that the approach downplays the moral quality of the standard conception value trinity, neutrality, non-accountability and partisanship, and so neutrality is not really neutral, instead, neutrality is saying that there is a moral value in having procedures embedded in law that allow individuals to pursue different moral plans. Point one two three. Tim De, a standard conception proponent, would seem to accept this as well when he writes that, these institutions and practices cannot guarantee outcomes that will suit all reasonable views, often there will be no such universally accepted outcomes. The hope of liberalism, however, is that even those whose substantive preferences do not win the day on this or that occasion, will have cause to accept the decisions of these institutions as fair and just. 124 as a second challenge to the standard conception, and as I have argued with Trevor Clark, 
Richard Mulhead and Alan Breener elsewhere. 125 If the basis for neutrality is respect for the individual as an autonomous moral person, 126 It is harder to see how that applies where the client is a company, a legal fiction without human dignity, equally, and following David Lupin, accepting respect for autonomy generally does not necessarily mean accepting respect for any particular exercise of autonomy, 127 Third, what the standard conception also does, and does problematically is to offer up a particular form of justice, small justice, as Rob Atkinson puts it 128, as the best we can hope for or expect, the best we can hope for or expect because we live in this world of radical normative disagreement, 129, a world in which it is not for the lawyer to seek to impose and preference their own views over the products of a democratically elected parliament, as such, a standard conception lawyer might say, the law allows us to seriously damage the environment potentially beyond repair, it is what it is, there is something unpleasant and unpersuasive about this defeatist approach, 130, not least because the small form of justice, that the standard conception preferences and prioritizes is not the form of justice needed for significant action to be taken on environmental harms, 131 day rights of the institutions of law mediating, between a plurality of reasonable views, plausibility and reasonableness being central to the acceptability of his support for standard conception lawyering, 132 but what about laws that permit significant environmental harms that we do not think are reasonable, or where, despite their legal entitlements, clients do not have good moral reasons, good plausibility, for the environmental harms they wish to bring about, 133 fourth, for the standard conception lawyer being faithful to the law and working out exactly what the law is, or the legal entitlements of any given client, may be challenging in situations in which the law is unclear, 134 or in which there are competing interpretations of the law, 135 as set out above, this challenge may be particularly acute for standard conception lawyers, who are advising on or whose work is shaped by environmental law, which is often open, texture, less amenable to legal certainty and, sometimes, constitutionally complex, 136 Stephen Pepper would likely counter by arguing that questions of interpretation and application, are, the normal grist for the lawyer's mill. 137 While this may, to varying degrees, be true, such an approach opens up grey areas for debate in which standard conception lawyers could, and many would, push uncertainty in the law towards their clients' goals and away from environmentally harm-reducing outcomes. Fifth, there is what Iris Van Domseler and Ruth de Bock label, the argument of domination as a challenge to the standard conception. This critique argues that proponents show little interest in a sensitivity to the empirical conditions that obtain in a concrete legal system, and to the concrete features of the parties involved. Point 138. What the standard conception does is, as Sung Hui Kim frames it, to both entrench and amplify unequal power, potentially undermining the autonomy and equal dignity of individuals. Point 139 here, Rick Abel has powerfully argued that a legal system could not be just unless it not only provided legal services to the unrepresented but also denied them to those who sought to amplify unequal power and privilege. 146, and as Parker reminds us, historically, the adversarial advocate approach was essentially liberal motivating lawyers to pursue client interests primarily against the power of the state. 141 Over time, this has moved to the lawyer representing private clients against other private interests and in other, non-state, contexts. Much of the work in favor of the standard conception is based in the need for, and role of, zealous lawyering in the criminal law context. There, an individual is facing off against the resources of the state, with particularly significant consequences where rigorous defense by the accused lawyer is not offered, 142 in the criminal context, it may also be especially important for a lawyer not to be associated with the taint of unpopular clients, 143 as such, the standard conception performs a useful social role, in maintaining the integrity of the criminal justice system, as well as protecting a defendant's private interests. Point 144 however, the position may be different in much environmental adjudication in which disputes are often about the need for collective action, for the wants and needs of the many to sometimes outweigh the wants and needs of the individual 145, and where big law and the government are likely to have better resources than the individuals and NGOs bringing environmental claims. This ignores, of course, 
the important point that most of the legal work that leads to environmental harms takes place away from courtrooms and often happens in private, in the giving of legal advice, in financing client action, in mergers and acquisitions, etc. 146 In those situations, excessive partisanship is not checked by the machinations of the adversarial system. 147 Such might in fact strongly suggest less of a role for the standard conception's zealous advocate. 148 As I have argued elsewhere, the institutional checks which limit adversarial zeal in courts do not regularly exist in the transactional context. Here there is no neutral umpire to scrutinize the claims made by lawyers on behalf of their clients. Point 149 Related to this, Emma Oakley and I would argue that the supposed public interest of zealous lawyering, that brings about environmental harms, in corporate and finance contexts to shore up the integrity of the legal system is less self-evident. 150 In corporate and financial work, the value trinity of the standard conception makes the zealous corporate finance advocate into a partisan. A moral technician 151, a qualitatively different relationship with qualitatively different consequences than in the criminal context, even if some standard conception proponents accept that the criminal context is different from the environmental, and the litigious from the transactional, 152 they would, it seems, still argue, as Wendell does, that, it is an aspect of the principal agent structure of the client-lawyer relationship, that the moral judgment calls off for the client to make point 153. This brings us back, full circle, to the idea of lawyers advising on and working within the law as properly enacted. If something is really so bad, the argument would go, then why is there not a law against it? The risk, according to Birgit Spieshofer, is that the lawyers would be replacing the legislator and all the courts as the ultimate body that decides in a democratic society what is acceptable and where to draw the line in case of competing rights and interests. Point 154 Pepper similarly suggests that lawyers cannot magically socialize the economy or legal services. Point 155 These arguments have some weight, in that they usefully ask us to reflect on the role of lawyers in society, and on the content as well as the procedural validity of law. 156 However, as well as being servants of their clients, lawyers also have agency to bring about, to not bring about, or to mediate environmental harms, the notion that lawyers are members of a democracy while also acting in relation to it, 157 This agency of lawyers, often unhelpfully ignored by standard conception theorists, is of course constrained, in practice shaped and limited by the rules, contexts, cultures and logics of the fields in which lawyers work, 158 By the associated individual and group level capacity of those lawyers to act on that agency and by the character of individual lawyers. 159 However, we read and hear far too much about lawyers as a moral technician facilitators of their clients' objectives versus lawyers as active designers and structuring forces, creating, innovating and influencing client decision, making. 160 Gordon reminds us that lawyers do more than encode the social bargains, they themselves contribute to producing the social meanings of law. 161 as such, while, in Wendell's terms, the moral judgment call is for the client to make, this does not necessarily deny the role of lawyer, exercising their agency, in actively speaking to and seeking to shape that call, in having lawyers develop and deploy moral qualities, if having those lawyers take moral positions seems too unpalatable. 1625, the ordinary morality of client, and matter onboarding, when a lawyer says, what I am doing for my client is perfectly legal, including the associated environmental harms, we will want to think about their actions in relation to professional ethics rules and lawyers' ethics more generally. But a related and important question is, why did you take that client's mandate on you in the first place? Here, I am unconvinced that lawyers' ethics either written down in the SRA's professional conduct rules, or more generally in the competing philosophical approaches actually has very much to do with the question of whether or not to act on an environmentally harmful matter for any given client. 163 Law firms, and their solicitors will ask themselves, should we take on this client and their matter, by reference, to the law, is what the client seeking to do and or asking of their lawyers legal, by reference to some of their legal professional obligations, are there any conflicts of interest, by reference to more general values. Does this matter or client fit with how they see themselves as a firm, and by reference to questions of capacity, expertise and profit, such decisions are, at heart, 
business decisions with some moral components. Client onboarding, as well as client deselection, has been a matter of some debate among legal ethicists. In a recent piece, Wendell writes, perhaps surprisingly, as a standard conception theorist, I believe many lawyer shaming campaigns are ethically defensible, and lawyers may be subject to moral criticism for the clients they choose to represent. 164, although he also says that refusal to act should be an exceptional event. 165 Monroe Friedman, another standard conception proponent, says lawyers have a personal moral responsibility for their decision to represent a client. 166 and, like Pepper, suggests that the standard conception approach allows for the exercise of moral judgment by lawyers as it permits the lawyer to reject or withdraw from acting for the client. 167 David Wilkins argues that both refusing and agreeing to act for clients carries moral significance. 168. This is something accepted by at least some lawyers in the largest and most prestigious of law firms. In 2020, the Clifford Chance Global Senior Partner Jeroen Awan spoke at the Green Horizon Summit. We can choose what we support and what we don't support. We do not have to be neutral professional service providers. We must use the power of the law to deliver a sustainable future. 169. In response to the why did you take on this client's mandate in the first place? Question. There is something that lawyers who work in large law firms frequently say. Everyone deserves legal advice. I find this response problematic for three reasons. The first is that it is very much the active choice of a large law firm whether to decide to act for a corporate client who wants to harm the environment. Few clients of these large firms are at Agnon because of financial necessity, despite focus on profits per equity partner, or, I suspect, strong moral drivers. Equally, the reasons that law firms have for choosing environment humming clients may be varied, including variation between what is offered up in public as the reasons for those choices and what is discussed or believed in private. Deborah Rode has suggested that lawyers have the ability to repackage occupational interests as societal imperatives, 170, with Ted Sknier commenting that many client regarding behaviors are often the result of the financial, psychological and organizational pressures of law practice, rather than the rules of legal ethics. 171 This leads me to wonder whether, or how often, we see the vice of environmental harms and associated law firm profits dressed up by lawyers in large firms as the professional virtue of providing neutral legal advice. 172 is zealous, client, first lawyering in fact just a convenient trope for disguised self-interest. 173 One practical way of perhaps exploring this commitment to access to justice would be to count up how many hours of legal pro bono advice large law firms give expressed as a percentage of that firm's billable hours. Work from an earlier project would suggest that that percentage would be very low indeed. 174. My general concern here is that the line everyone deserves legal advice is one that has become conveniently justified within the field of large law firm, lawyering and in individual firms without much thought as to what those words mean, or on under what conditions that starting premise is or could be acceptable. 175. The second problematic aspect to the line that everyone deserves legal advice is that it likely presupposes a legal system in which there is some form of equality of arms. As we know, access to justice often depends on resources. Clients who can afford to pay for legal services can rapidly exhaust adversaries who cannot and thus turn the legal system into a device for evading the very rules it is designed to enforce or worse into a medium for extortion and oppression of the weak by the strong point 176 economic strength can have a destabilizing effect on the integrity of the justice system 177 and we see this made tangible in lawyers engaging in environmental law for including in the examples discussed above point 178 the rule of law does not guarantee the right to any particular lawyer or any particular law firm or arguably to a lawyer at all in civil cases 179 and there is nothing to suggest that a firm's refusal to take on any given client or mandate is a particular matter of rule of law significance. 180. The third thing I find problematic is that the lawyers who say everyone deserves legal advice are often also deeply hypocritical. The line everyone deserves legal advice would be more palatable if lawyers actually acted on it, but they do not. In one project, the corporate finance lawyers that Emma Oakley, and I interviewed repeatedly told us that it was not their job to judge what their clients did, 
that they were simply neutral providers of advice, and that the client took the decisions on how to act. What was interesting, however, was that several interviewees, despite acting very happily for certain companies or industries, which others might have moral concerns about, still had their own very personal, highly individualized, moral red lines. We decided to call these personal red lines guerrilla exceptions, for reasons which will become obvious in a moment, though I now think we should have called this meatloaf lawyering, in that many of the lawyers we interviewed were saying, I'll do anything for my clients, but I won't do that. Let me offer three examples. One finance partner we interviewed was absolutely clear that his job was not to judge the actions of his clients, that his clients could engage in whatever business they chose within the limits of the law, and that he would, for example, happily do tobacco defense work. But he went on to say this 181, in spite of everything that I have said so far, I do have a very strong view about environmental protection and animals in particular. If somebody came to me and said, we've got this amazing mandate to build a something on the mountains of DRC that currently are home to 500 gorillas, I might struggle a bit with that. A different corporate partner had said to us that he did not care if his client's solar panels were made using slave labor, but went on to say that he could not do any work for gambling companies. 182 in my own professional life. I was content enough to act for oil and gas companies and arms manufacturers, but left my first law firm in part because I was unwilling to do tobacco litigation defense work. These examples resonate with more current trends. Think of how, in early 2022, so many London law firms began one week by saying everyone deserves legal advice and we will continue to act for our Russian clients and then had dropped those same clients by the end of the following week. What these less and more contemporaneous examples suggest is that the commitment of certain lawyers to respect for the law was a neutral field in which clients operate and deserve legal advice may be somewhat constrained. What we see in meatloaf lawyering, and what I think we will see more and more of when it comes to environmental harms, are what we might broadly call own interest or positional conflicts. Some kind of conscientious objection by a lawyer or a firm to a particular client or particular matter, 183 Wendell argues that lawyers only have a conscientious objection where they have such a fundamental moral disagreement that it essentially rises to the level of a conflict of interest. 184 Some lawyers asked to effect environmental harms for their clients may now be in that space, especially in the context of climate harming work for the Garden Majors. 185 6 Conclusion in the things they do for their clients, advising on the law, buying and selling companies, raising finance, meaning making, in contract, via lobbying, through arguments in court etc, resolving disputes and so on, lawyers are repeat players, yet often overlooked, in the stories of, legally permitted, environmental harms, such, legal, environmental harm causing work may be more or less ethically problematic, for those who loophole, bully, cheat and or take unfair advantage of others, the associated rules of professional conduct place boundaries on permissible tactics. In other situations, where lawyers do not deploy these sorts of tactics, I have argued that professional rules, in the form of the SRA's principles, require active counseling by solicitors with their clients on the environmental harms that their clients wish to engender. This active counseling is about giving life to the regulatory requirements to act with integrity, independence and in a client's best interests. There may also be times when the public interest, acting as a tiebreak in the SRA's principles, will require solicitors to step back from environmental harm causing work for their clients, although under what conditions this rule will bite in this way is unhelpfully unclear. When it comes to the theories of lawyers' ethics, the standard conception, as the name suggests, is the dominant approach, both among legal ethicists and, because it is so useful as a rationalization for potentially problematic action among practicing lawyers. In this paper, I have challenged the supposed neutrality of the standard conception, set out how its preference for a thin rule of law approach to legal certainty is problematic given the nature of environmental law, questioned its foundations in the criminal law context, and how well they map onto environmental issues, and suggested that the small form of justice that the standard conception preferences and prioritizes is not the form of justice needed for the urgent work necessary on climate and other environmental harms. 186 In his recent book, Wendell writes that lawyers are accountable to others for the clients they represent. 
What he means by this is not that they are wrongdoers for so acting, but that lawyers must give an account for themselves, that is, offer a justification in terms that others can accept. Point one eight seven. when it comes to lawyers who act for clients who seek to legally harm the environment, the much-repeated accountability line that everyone deserves legal advice is problematic. It ignores the fact that solicitors' decisions to act for any given client are commercial decisions, and not ones of legal ethics. It presupposes a legal system in which there is some form of equality of arms, when there is not. It also assumes that solicitors act consistently about client and matter onboarding, when they instead sometimes engage in meatloaf lawyering. That much repeated line may simply be a story that lawyers tell themselves to rationalize their conduct. 188 And so the accounts given for why lawyers, especially those in large firms, act for clients who want to significantly harm the environment are seriously lacking. Here, it seems evident to me that lawyers acting for the garden majors on significant climate projects, new fossil fuel plants, new oil and gas licensing rounds etc., will need to give particular account of why they are so acting, given the special and existential nature of the threat of climate change. As such, lawyers should face head into, and not shy away from, the moral judgments of the effects of their work. I wrote earlier that I was not interested in the various forces and factors that made lawyers act in the way that they act, but having set out my stall, my claim that professional conduct rules require lawyering that seeks to counsel on and reduce environmental harms, and that solicitors may legitimately decide to not act, and in some situations must not act, for certain clients, it would be naive not to recognize explicitly the challenge in operationalizing this version of professional ethicality. What is needed next is some work on putting this theory into practice. Lawyers might, for example, say to their clients we think you shouldn't do X because it is very risky, not least because of these relevant and significant environmental, social, and governance concerns and drivers. Or they might say we think doing X is environmentally unsound ethically reprehensible, and that you would be an awful person stroke entity if you did it. One strategy might have better practical traction than the other. Finally, if you are a lawyer and find yourself on a blind date, let us hope that you can marshal a sufficient account of your professional choices that the good, looking and environmentally conscious individual on the other side of the table, concludes that you are on the whale-saving side of the profession. That is probably a better outcome for your evening, and also for the planet. Copyright the author, S. 2023, published by Oxford University Press on behalf of Faculty of Laws, University College London. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License, https colon, slash slash, creativecommons.org, slash licenses, slash by, slash 4.0, slash, which permits unrestricted reuse distribution, and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Stephen Vaughan, Existential Ethics, Thinking Hard About Lawyer Responsibility for Clients' Environmental Harms, Current Legal Problems, Volume 76, Issue 1, 2023, pages 1 to 34, https colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093 slash CLP slash code 005